playlist can you see what is going on here on your screen ladies and gentlemen those in the hall those in the comforts of your rooms and those um, in different time zones who are not so comfortable and suppressing a yawn at the moment uh, my apologies and my welcome to one and all and we get into this we start straight away with this hybrid super specialty contact lens symposium we've got a very exciting two days uh, of talks uh, some will be delivered at the podium here itself. Some will be delivered by speakers from across the globe and across the country. And um, I'm sure that all those delegates who are tuned in will have a feast of information over the next weekend, over this weekend, with a music program in the evening today to break the lull. Uh, without further ado, I request Chandrasekhar Chavan to start the program. So our first uh, keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Ellis Kramer from Miami. Uh, she is a resident trained optometrist uh, uh, with a very big practice uh, called uh, Miami uh, Contact Lens Institute. Uh, she has a, uh, awarded doctorate from University de Montreal in 2012. And she has done uh, many fellowship programs. Uh, she is uh, on the uh, panel of Scleral Lens Society uh, Scleral Lens Education Society. She has uh, been conducting many uh, conferences uh, in the U.S. And uh, I personally thank her for accepting my invitation. She was supposed to come here personally, and that's how this event started, uh, that she said, yes, I'll come. But because of the uh, travel restrictions, uh, she could not come. So we decided to just uh, get the U.S. people online and the local people from here to be in person. So, without further ado, I ask uh, Alice to give her keynote presentation. Dr. Alice. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, we can hear you. You can hear me okay? Recording in progress. Awesome. Well, it's, uh, it's really an honor to be here with you, and I want to thank you um, for inviting me. And um, I'm really looking forward to kicking off this meeting. Um, it's such a great meeting, a lot of really wonderful speakers, and it's really an honor to be part of them. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about all sorts of things, but I want to start it off with something very relevant, um, and that's basically what's new, what's going on in the specialty lens realm, and what's new, what's, what, what is the latest? So these are the latest number from the IMI about myopia, and um, one thing I noticed is that this session is really 
predominating about myopia. So I decided to start with this. We all know that, you know, myopia is a global epidemic. It's increasing. And we really have to do everything we can as practitioners, not only to correct myopia, but also to prevent its progression. We know that myopia progression um, is related to, associated to issues uh, of ocular health issues. And the more myopia grows, the more at risk people are developing these conditions. So we have the numbers in the UK, about 23% of people have myopia, Iran, 8%, China, 47%, 53% in Singapore, Australia, 31%, um, 17% in Chile, 62% uh, in Hong Kong, and the USA, we're at 42%. And we're approaching that 50% mark. And one thing that's interesting actually is that we know that uh, because of the pandemic, there has been an increase in myopia. And this has been shown um, in several studies, but this one is one of the uh, better conducted studies. Progression of myopia in school-aged children after COVID-19 home confinement um, so the conclusions of this uh, paper were that home confinement during the COVID-19 pandemic appeared to be associated with a significant myopic shift for children aged six to eight years, according to 2020 school-based photo screenings. However, you know, there were obviously limit limitations in the studies, but younger children's refractive status may be more sensitive to environmental change than older ages, and given the younger children are in critical period for, for the development of their myopia. So it really does show that near work, reading, being on screens, home confinement, um, doing classes from home actually contributed to an increase of myopia. And so we know that spending more time outside is important and these studies highlight those, those things. So what about orthokeratology? I wanna talk about orthokeratology a little bit. Um, orthokeratology has existed for a long time. It's one of the oldest treatments that we have for myopia management. Um, and basically, what's the, something new that, that we have now in orthokeratology are the toric curves. And toric curves allow better alignment of um, the orthokeratology lenses. So we can see here before and after orthokeratology treatment. So the basic, you know, basic obviously is not too basic, but basic orthokeratology lens will have the back optic zone radius, the reverse curve, some alignment curves and peripheral curves. But, you know, and that needs each curve and you can see here which each curve does. You have central flattening of the central part and then you have the reverse zone where you have that epithelial cell migration, and then you have the alignment curves and the peripheral curves. But when you have limbus to limbus astigmatism um, and it extends that way, it's important to look at rotationally asymmetric lenses. And when you have rotationally asymmetric lenses, the lens parameters um, are identical to that of a, uh, of a spherical design with some key differences. While the base curve and peripheral curve remain symmetrical, the reverse curves um, will be different and that provides a, a closer fit um, and provide a better alignment of the lenses. So another thing that I wanna to touch on and something that is obviously up and coming is scleral lenses um, for the use of severe ocular surface disease. So we have well-established indications of scleral lenses for um, irregular corneas, for regular astigmatism, um, post-surgical uh, conditions, and now we also are using scleral lenses a lot for ocular surface disease. So if we look at this cornea, this is, you know, both of the eyes were like this, severe SPK. So when we talk about aqueous deficient dry eye, most commonly it's caused by inflammatory infiltration of the lacrimal gland. And in severe cases, it's going to be from Sjogren's syndrome. And in less severe cases, it's non-Sjogren's syndrome. 
So basically, inflammation causes both acinar and ductor epithelial cell dysfunction and destruction. An epithelial injury and defective glycocalyx, loss of tear volume and goblet cell mucin, leading to increased frictional damage and friction-related symptoms. This causes tear hyperosmolarity, epithelial injury caused by dry eye disease, which stimulates corneal nerve endings, ultimately leading to a lot of pain, discomfort, um, increased blink rate, uh, and, and obviously reflex tearing. So these patients are usually in a lot of pain. And one way of diagnosing this condition is by using um, lysamine green. So lysamine green is a tool, a vital dye that we can all use in our clinics, in our practice, in order to help diagnose aqueous deficient dry eye and other types of dry eye as well. So you look at it under white light and diffuse illumination, and it's really good at highlighting dead and devitalized cells on the conjunctiva. Okay, so you can see a very diffuse four plus staining of the conjunctiva here. And it's actually very, very painful. And if you flip the lid over, you can sometimes see this. This is called lid wiper epitheliopathy. And lid wiper epitheliopathy is really important to look for. It's actually a sign that there's a lot of friction between the eyelid and the ocular surface. And it's, it's actually a huge indicator of dryness and pain and severe dry eye. So a lot of people who have severe dry eye, if you look for this, you'll find it and you really have to flip the lid. And sometimes you can get this from contact lens wear as well. So it's actually the friction of the eyelid either on the contact lens surface or on the surface of the eye, okay, in severe dry eye. So definitely look for this as an indicator for dry eye. And Fluorescein staining. So fluorescein, what you have is staining of the cornea. It will also stain the conjunctiva, but it's really, really good at highlighting dead and devitalized cells on the cornea. And obviously with this, you use blue filter, you use your rattan filter to increase the contrast. And you can see here that, you know, this cornea, for example, is, is extremely irritated and you've got a lot of dead and devitalized cells here. So other ways to diagnose aqueous deficient dry eye, and these are all things that we can do in the office. So on the top um, left, you have the test called the phenol red thread test. So that is to measure the volume of the tears. It's basal tears. And um, what you do is you put the string um, inside. It's obviously a pH sensitive string and you allow the tears after about 